Well, good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure to see you all here for this event. And it's also wonderful to be back at the Korea Society. And I'm wondering how many of you have ever attended a North Korean propaganda poster exhibition. <laughs> <laughs> for many people, North Korea itself remains a mystery to say nothing about Korean art. Therefore, I do hope that this exhibition will provide a window for viewing the country from a different angle, away from the usual images of missiles, hunger, misery, and military parades. The posters as such will change very little, but they offer us a rare glimpse into a little known world. During the five years I lived in Pyongyang, and that is from 2006 to September last year, working for the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, in short, SDC, I started a hobby, visiting art galleries and collecting Korean art, mostly hand-painted posters but I also have a few oil paintings and woodblock prints. Other artwork could also be found there. Ink paintings, pencil drawings, calligraphy, watercolor pictures, stone powder paintings, slate stone engravings and pottery, small sculptures, big sculptures, and handicrafts such as embroidery. And even at times I felt that postage stamps were like tiny pieces of art. The selection of posters here today illustrate spe specific topics in agriculture, animal husbandry, and food production. Areas of interest to me because my work included addressing food and food security related issues. North Korean posters portray a wide variety of topics, from slogans reinforcing policies of the party, army, and youth league, <coughs> to messages reiterating campaigns in culture, public health, education, and sports. These are often taken from statements and speeches by the country's leadership or from newspaper editorials, but all serve as public education tools and also for community mobilization. The posters, however, offer no insights into the daily lives of the North Korean people. Images usually depict the desired state of reality, glorifying the political system and leadership or aim at communicating correct attitudes and values. North Koreans are accustomed to being constantly surrounded by such posters in public buildings, on billboards, on the walls in hospitals, schools, offices, factories, and shops. In his book, 1984, George Orwell describes a world where color is only to be found in propaganda posters. And such has been the case in North Korea, especially when I visited the country for the first time in spring 1995. Now, changes are creeping in and the uniformity is gradually fading away, but the postal colors remain as striking as ever. Posters are an effective way to convey messages to the general population in North Korea. And with the absence of commercial advertising, except for two massive signboards in Pyongyang for locally produced cars, 
North Korean propaganda art seems almost comparable to advertising in our industrialized world. The artists, they are usually trained at the Pyongyang Uni University of Fine Art or the Pyongyang Art College. And they are, are all members of the Korean Artists Federation. Art students can often be seen painting or drawing in parks. Those artists always produce traditional landscape scenes, leaving very little scope for creativity or innovation. Abstract art does not even exist. In North Korea, the state guides artistic production and art is generally produced for the state itself. Artists, artists must create a certain number of pieces per month for a salary from their work unit, such as one of the various art production businesses. The Mansude Art Company in Pyongyang is often on the itinerary for tourists and the company employs over 3,700 workers, which includes over 1,000 artists as well as technical support staff and administrators. And then every year, usually in January, a poster exhibition takes place to promote the task or the tasks set forth in the joint New Year editorial which is an annual leadership policy address. And this year was no exception, with 80 posters bearing slogans such as, let us devotedly defend the Central Party Committee headed by the respected dear comrade Kim Jong-un. Two messages encouraging the people to carry out tasks in accordance with the Korean Workers' Party strategy for achieving prosperity. This kind of art has become a tool to engage communities in various levels of change, but also to control their hearts and minds. Posters, as you may have seen already, are rarely signed or dated, but the bold colors carry meaning. For example, red is the color of socialism and also good fortune. Blue means peace and harmony or symbolizes integrity. And many of you surely know that the Korean unification flag is light blue on a white background. Black represents evil and is often used in anti-United States or anti-Japan posters. Yellow and gold stands for glory and prosperity. Poster statements are clear and direct, mostly single line catchphrases in bright red lettering with an exclamation mark at the end, such as rice is our socialism concentrate on farming with full mobilization. Let's enhance the party's potato farming revolution policy. Let's save even trivial things. I like that one particularly. <laughs> the more trees, the greener the homeland. Also a very important message. Or let's promote traditional sports and games. The people depicted in North Korean posters can be basically divided into four groups. We have soldiers, workers, intellectuals, and farmers. Interestingly, interestingly practically all of the farmers, not only in this poster collection, but in general, are smiling females. During my SDC years, we worked with cooperative farms addressing food security issues. Working hard, 
day after day, the farmers there did not have much to smile about. They worried about fulfilling government set targets, avoiding natural disasters such as floods and droughts, and obtaining sufficient fertilizer, plastic sheeting, and diesel fuel. Improving seeds, promoting potato farming, increasing yields with double cropping, supporting rabbit or goat breeding, and upgrading fish farming were all part of our work in the agricultural sector. And it was fun to see these messages in the posters. <laughs> also, I was never quite sure if they were depicting our techniques or reviving and updating old concepts. But it did not matter as such, as long as the people's livelihoods showed improvements. So why did I start collecting posters? I have no background in art, but it gave me something to do, something to do on Saturday afternoon, the opportunity to go out and meet different people, occasionally even the artists. And with this exhibition, I hope to make a small contribution towards fostering a better understanding of a country about which so little is known. Moreover, I also believe that these posters will one day be historical documents. I would like to thank the Korea Society in New York for the opportunity given to me to show my posters to a wider audience. And before I close, I would like to show you some photos I took while living in North Korea. And there you will see how these posters are integrated in the daily life. So thank you and let's have a look at the posters. I'm not sure how this works. <laughs> I left five years in, Co in Korea does not teach you how to handle modern technology. <laughs> so I'm still struggling. Uh, this one, okay, thank you. I don't think they need much explanation. This is at the DMZ. Um, I think it says Korea is one. This is the poster produced and widely distributed for the 2008 population census. Uh, policewoman and the poster in the background for the 150 day campaign, art for some art shows, 2012, 14th of April, important dates. Um, I can't read this, so no comments. <laughs> we have enough Koreans here who can read it. <laughs> um, this is at, the food, at a food factory. Chuche Tower at the background. Uh, this was in an orphanage. I can't remember where. And I think the picture is telling. The picture in the foreground and the, the children, the children in the front and the children in the back. This is one of the Korean advertisements, the car they produce. This is again 150 day campaign, Mar Pyongyang Marathon. Must have to do with the army. By the way, bicycles are now very, very popular in the whole country. Uh, this was, I think, on a cooperative farm. Again, I can't read it. Uh, this is the rabbit poster, a similar one is out there. Again, uh, I think this was for the film festival. This must be, well, it's the party 
the army, the intellectuals, the party sign up there. This was in a shop window for the Arirang festival. So these are prints because some of these posters then get printed. 2012. Um, again, this was actually at the fertilizer factory in Hamhung. Uh, this was in a school. This was in a cooperative farm, which shows the targets I think they have to achieve. This was. Um, Raise the Red Lantern, the Chinese opera, which was played in Pyongyang, and I quite like this poster. This was one of the woodblock prints I have. Uh, this is my f absolute favorite. I bought it off the wall in a shop because this is Korean advertisement. My lovely friend, Thermo Shopping Sack for Supermarket, Japan China Joint Venture Product. Okay, and look at her. As this sack is useful for keeping food stock warm or cold mainly, it will be your best choice in preserving, carrying, and packing all kinds of cold storage food stock. And then we have heat and cold. I, I love this. <laughs> so we could have some, perhaps some training courses in uh, modern advertisement. And this is my absolute favorite. This is an oil painting I bought at one of the galleries. And it's really beautiful. And then the final one is a bit of almost pop art. The traffic ladies with the signs so that we had to learn because we could drive in Pyongyang provided we passed the driving test and that's how you learned. So thank you very much. And I think we have a couple of uh, minutes for questions, if there are any. OK. Thank you, Katerina, for, uh, for the uh, very interesting uh, <laughs> Uh, exhibition and your talk. Uh, I'm, I'm James Lim, a member of, of the Queer Society, and uh, just a quick question is, um, can you comment on the, on the North Korean food situation? Has the hunger problem uh, been largely solved, or are there, is there still uh, hunger, and to what extent is mm -hmm. there uh, starvation? Okay. Well, right now, <coughs> What we have had for quite many years, it's chronic malnutrition. It's not acute starvation. Also, there are pockets of extreme poverty. However, the latest news are that there are some problems with water. There is a drought, but I cannot really comment on that. I'm not on the ground, and I do know that the UN will do an assessment fairly soon. So hopefully we have news on that. But the situation is certainly still fragile. And personally, I think it's important that especially the children get food, and not just any food. It's important that they get enriched food with vitamins and minerals so that their growth is not hampered too much. And if I can do a bit of advertisement here, in July, my colleague, who is the head of the World Food Program, will give a talk here on the food situation. And she will be much better versed on talking about the present situation than, than I am. But food aid is still important. There's one more question. quite difficult to see from here. The light is very bright. So. Yes. Were you able to visit the art school? And if so, how, how, what were they teaching in the art school? Were they, 
Were they doing life studies? Were they teaching, uh, showing Rembrandts and Vermeers or in Western art? How were they <laughs> teaching art? Well, it was, I mean, I've been to the big Mansude art studio and also to some smaller studios. I didn't really see much of the teaching, but there are certainly no museums where you would see Rembrandts and, and all that. But they do have some, some good artists, amazingly. And they do have some books, but not, not museums to go to and study a, a real picture, Western picture. I mean, they have Korean art, but that's more the traditional Korean art. There's one question over there. Uh, Homer Williams, uh, uh, I, I uh, was just wondering now that uh, I believe all EU countries recognize North Korea. Uh, uh, did you notice a, a growth in kind of a dialogue among the uh, uh, the embassies there? And did you uh, uh, have a lot of contact with uh, uh, the other European embassies in Pyongyang? Uh, there are basically seven uh, European ambassadors in Pyongyang. Um, others have their ambassadors accredited to Pyongyang but are based in South Korea or in Beijing. Uh, France does not have diplomatic relations with um, North Korea, and one more small con Estonia, right, yeah. And we have a former ambassador here, John Evera, who used to be the British ambassador in Pyongyang, so, and we know each other from those days, and he's publishing a book, and will come out very soon, and he will speak here too, so. <laughs> um, of course, the whole idea of diplomacy is having uh, more dialogue, more interactions, uh, so I strongly feel the more we talk to the North Koreans, the better. Uh, of course, it, the more embassies that are there, the more offices like my office was, uh, bilateral offices, NGOs, it all helps. They all contribute to involve North Korea more in what's going on and what's going on in their own country, but also in the rest of the world. Hi, I was just wondering, um, is there any effort there to preserve traditional methods of art? Absolutely, yes. I, I do have some traditional, uh, you know, calligraphies, woodblock prints and other prints. Oh yeah, they have uh, quite some of that too. But I didn't collect that, I focused on the posters. I just have a few examples. And then oil paintings, watercolor, not, you know, not poster art. There's one more over there. Hi, thank you for coming and interesting talk. Um, we've been hearing about North Korea uh, not being able to feed themselves for years and years. And what seems to be the main problem that they cannot produce enough food to feed themselves? Well, it's, I could go on for an hour on that. <laughs> uh, I mean, there are many, many issues. You know, uh, the crisis started basically when they lost, when North Korea lost their former partners, and that was with the, with the breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, they lost their trading partners and then in addition there is not an awful lot of good arable land. Uh, it's very mountainous and it's only about 18 to 20 percent which is real good agricultural land. And then they had all sorts of natural disasters plus isolation and not producing anything. Personally, I think they would need to 
we start their industries, produce goods, sell it, earn money, and import food. But that would mean a change in the policy. And that we are not yet there. Also, I do see small changes. It's low. Uh, we need a lot of patience, but I do see changes happening. And also, nowadays, a much bigger interest of North Koreans to learn about how the market economy functions. Because if they want to do business with people from the market economy, they need to understand how we tick in order to create a win-win situation. And that has certainly changed in the last couple of years. There are many more training programs in all sorts of uh, fields related to the economy. So I have a little bit of hope that things will move on, also at a very slow pace, because another big hindering factor is, of course, uh, the sanctions they have and their own behavior. Any more questions? It's hard for me to see, so. And if not, then, yeah, I see one more at the back. Yeah, pardon the simple question, but how did you obtain these works of art? I know that they're kind of ubiquitous across North Korea, but I imagine you don't just walk up to a wall and rip it off. Is there a, is there a store that sells these? Oh, or? yeah. No, they are art galleries. And that's what I did on a Saturday afternoon. I would go and visit the different art galleries. And that the galleries, they're selling the propaganda materials, not traditional Korean art uh, pieces? Both. 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 Okay. both. So, no, that's possible. And I, I thought it was interesting. I met different people at the art galleries than I would uh, meet in my job. Um, Kathy, um, um, yesterday at AEI in Washington, uh, there was a report uh, released on the uh, so-called um, uh, Sungbun system, the classification system, you know, like your family background. And, and um, apparently this is a very extensive report that's been worked on for years, at least a, a year or more. Mm -hmm. And um, the... Uh, argument that's being made is that even though it was just released officially within the last few days, uh, that it probably was a major influence on thinking about the um, food aid to North Korea over the last year in the Obama administration. In other words, uh, the great emphasis placed on the possibility that food would be diverted uh, to elites and all this kind of thing. Uh, what is your impression from your, particularly the time you spent living in Pyongyang, about how accurate those perceptions are? How driving this notion of, you know, the classification peop of people based on their background as defined by the party or whatever agencies define that status? Mm -hmm. It's a very good question and I think those of us who have been involved in food aid have been all grappling with this question. But just a few points. Uh, there's basically no food aid going to Pyongyang. And the elite is definitely in Pyongyang. So that's one point. Then food aid is planned and is planned to go to the most vulnerable. And that is children, pregnant and nursing women, the sick, and the aged. But for the past few years, WFP had not enough food to provide for all those that would need food aid. So basically, the program has been scaled down to children below the age of five, and maybe some other groups at time. And my own experience is that a lot has to do with planning. And when you do the planning together with your North Korean partner, you already build in the monitoring system. And with that, the North Koreans are aware what is ahead of them in terms of monitoring. And during my Caritas days, we actually did not have any major problems. But of course, 
no food aid program anywhere in the world is 100%. I mean, that's just not impossible because we cannot follow every single rice sack. But it's a lot has to do with the planning and how you add the monitoring to it. Um, diversion of food aid. The food aid provided, I don't think, is that much of interest to the elite. Uh, there is basically no rice provided. The elite eats mostly rice. It's corn or some porridge uh, enriched with vitamins and minerals. And we, uh, it, one of these is called corn soya blend. And I remember at one of the interagency meetings, we all talked like the greatest experts about corn soya blend. And then somebody said, how many of you have tasted corn soya blend? Nobody. So uh, next interagency meeting, we got a spoonful of corn soya blend. And I can tell you it was all work. <laughs> so it's also a question what you provide. Uh, and I do feel strongly, uh, we do have pretty good figures about how many children are in institutions, are in schools, and therefore you can monitor that. Monitor that and you need to provide double FP enough money to hire enough money monitors and to look after the food. I would certainly not recommend just to give food to the government. You don't do that anywhere in the country, uh, in the world. Because we, our mission is also to teach our North Korean partner what is accountability in terms of receiving aid vis-a-vis -vis the donors too. Hi, Katarina. I have a question about the posters. Uh, if you don't mind sharing, when you were collecting these, how much did each poster cost you about in US dollars or uh, whatever currency you want to use? You know, it's very hard to put the figure on because they have different prices and I was a good customer and in my having lived in Asia long enough, you bargain. So I bargained. <laughs> And I would never just buy one. I would always buy four or five, and therefore, you know, the ticket, the price ticket was different than uh, if you only buy one. And let's say the oil painting is, is one of my most expensive ones. Uh, these were not, these were $50, $60, no, euros. Uh, also depending on the size, depending if they were on canvas or if they were on paper, if they were acrylic or oil paintings. So a lot, if they were well-known artists or junior artists, so it all depends a bit. But I must say some of those I have seen sold on the internet are heavily overpriced. Let me just put it that way, in case you're looking at buying, bargain. <laughs> Hi, Kathy. I have a question. In February, Beijing, we know there was a talk between North Korea and China and the US. There was, sorry, I there was a talk between North Korea and US. Yeah. And based on the talk, the U.S. government was about to provide the food, like oh, 20,000 yeah. tons every month. But it changed the mind because North Korea launched the missile. So do you think the North Korea's decision was right to do the missile launch instead of getting food for the people? Let me just say, I think the missile launch was planned a long time before the food aid was planned, and that was the wish of Kim Jong-il. So I don't think young Kim Jong-un could have changed that. And for me, right from the onset, I had a big problem with uh, that deal because I felt there was something not quite right because there was a need for two statements, one by the US and one by North Korea. Usually when you have a good agreement, you only need one 
statement. So I felt that was something was not good from the beginning. So it did not surprise me that much that it did not happen. I regret it for the sake of the people, of course. There's no question about that. Sorry, I, I really can't see if there is another question. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, you mentioned earlier that one of the reasons for the starvation right now is um, North Korea lost the USSR. Why hasn't China been able to replace the USSR as a trading partner? Uh, China, in fact, is the biggest trading partner of North Korea. When you go to a market in Pyongyang, but also in the countryside, 75% of the goods are all from China. So uh, China, I think without China, North Korea would uh, be even more poor, even poorer. And um, China does not release figures about the food aid they provide, and therefore I cannot say much about that, but there is also food aid going to the country from China. Uh, having lived in China during the Cultural Revolution, I wonder what was your communication language-wise uh, with your partners? Uh, <clears throat> I regret that I didn't have the time to learn uh, Korean. I was uh, thrown into the job. But uh, our office was an English-speaking office. So I had, at one time, 10 North Korean liaison officers, uh, 10 North Korean project officers, one liaison officer, and they all spoke good English. And the problem was also they want to improve their English, so they refused to teach me any Korean. So if you can't learn on your job, it's pretty tough. So uh, that was the language. And, um, so, and I had one interpreter who would come along to meetings. And uh, the interpreter I had had actually lived abroad most of his life, grew up in uh, different countries, so it was uh, interesting for me to see how he interacted with his own people. I'm interested in the, the one English poster that you had uh, shown in your slide. Um, I'm sure the intended audience was not the Korean people themselves, in your opinion, what do you think the purpose of a poster printed in English is? And who do you think is the intended audience for a poster like that? Or is it just for sort of kitsch factor? Is it just them having oh, fun? Oh, no, that was dead serious. It was <laughs> at the shop. It was at the old diplomatic club uh, where all the diplomats and the international community would go uh, have meals or shop there. And no, she had a pile of these sacks, and she was one eager to sell them. So it was intended for people who went to the diplomatic club. Good. I think, uh, I hope you now will have a look at the posters and uh, see them with perhaps different eyes. And I hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for coming. Mm -hmm.